In the late 1950s, West Germany adopted a new battle rifle, whose internal mechanics were rooted in the final weapons projects of Nazi Germany. How did a design born in the ruins of the Third Reich become the backbone of more than 60 armies in the democratic West? Why has it remained in service for over 60 years while so many modern rifles have come and gone? This is the story of the HKG-3. When Germany surrendered in 1945, the Allies dismantled its weapons industry, factories were closed, machinery was seized, and the production of military arms was banned. Yet ideas do not disappear as easily as buildings and machines. Blueprints, prototypes, and the knowledge of skilled engineers survived the collapse. Among these engineers was Ludwig Vorgrimmler. He had worked at Mauser on a prototype rifle known as the Sturmgewehr 45M. Unlike the famous STG-44, this late war design used a radical new operating system called Roller Delayed Blowback. Instead of using propellant gas to operate the action, it relied on two locking rollers and an angled locking piece to hold the bolt closed for a fraction of a second until chamber pressure dropped to safe levels. This made the mechanism simpler, cheaper to produce, and less maintenance heavy than gas systems. After the war, Vorgrimmler was taken to France to work at CEAM, a research facility developing small arms. There he refined his roller Roller delayed design into a prototype chambered for intermediate cartridges. The French military found it promising but eventually lost interest and the project stalled. In 1950, Vorgrimmler accepted an offer to work in Spain at CETME, the Centro de Estudios Técnicos de Materiales Especiales. Here he developed the SETME Model A, chambered for a unique 7.92 by 40 mm cartridge. The rifle was lightweight, controllable in automatic fire, and offered good range for its size. However, NATO's 1954 decision to standardize on the more powerful 7.62 by 51 millimeter cartridge meant that the SETME would need to be redesigned for a round with much higher recoil and chamber pressure. While Spain worked on the conversion, Spain Field tested a reduced power 7.62 by 51 SETME loading with a lighter bullet before moving to full power 7.62 by 51 NATO in later production, which required strengthened parts and updated bolt geometry. The newly rearming West Germany was searching for a standard rifle for its Bundeswehr. Trials compared the SETME against the Belgian FNFAL, the American M14, and the Swiss SIG510. The SETME impressed evaluators with its controllability, simple maintenance, and adaptability for German production. West Germany saw not only a capable rifle, but also an opportunity to revive its defense manufacturing industry. Could a wartime German design be transformed into the trusted rifle of NATO forces guarding the front lines of the Cold War? In 1956, Heckler & Koch, a new German arms manufacturer founded by former Mauser engineers, secured a license to produce the Ketme in Germany. Working closely with the Spanish team, they strengthened the receiver, modified the bolt head and locking piece to handle NATO pressures, and improved the sights and ergonomics. By 1959, the rifle was adopted as the Gewehr 3 or G3. It kept the roller delayed blowback system, but was optimized for mass production and durability. When a shot is fired, the bolt head tries to move rearward under pressure. Two steel rollers on the bolt head are wedged into recesses in the barrel extension, locking it in place. The angled locking piece, connected to the bolt carrier, forces the rollers inward only after the carrier moves slightly. This mechanical delay ensures that the bolt remains closed until chamber pressures are low enough for safe extraction. 
The benefits were clear. The design eliminated the need for a gas piston or operating rod, making the rifle cleaner running and easier to maintain. The straight line recoil path helped keep sights on target during semi-automatic fire. The absence of a gas system also made it easy to create shorter or longer variants without complex adjustments. Manufacturing methods drew from wartime German experience. The receiver was made from stamped sheet steel welded together, which was faster and cheaper than milling from solid steel. The cold hammer forged barrel was designed for long service life and the chamber featured shallow flutes that allowed gas to flow around the cartridge case during extraction, reducing the chance of stuck cases and easing the load on the extractor. Field stripping required no tools. Two captive pins allowed the stock and trigger group to be removed, and the bolt group could then be slid out. The trigger pack was a self-contained module, allowing quick swaps between semi-automatic, burst, and full automatic fire configurations. It was a rifle born from a wartime prototype, refined in peacetime, and ready for the challenges of the Cold War. Standard G3A3 weight is about 4.4 kilograms empty. The G3A4 about 4.7 kilograms with a typical cyclic rate around 500 to 600 rounds per minute and an effective sighted range to 800 meters with optics. The earliest G3 rifles had wooden stocks and slim handguards, but these were soon replaced by synthetic furniture that was more resistant to weather and hard use. The standard G3A3 model had a fixed stock and wide handguard, while the G3A4 featured a retractable steel stock favored by airborne and mechanized troops. Variants multiplied. The G3K carbine was shorter and lighter for close quarters combat. The G3SG-1 was a designated marksman version with a heavy barrel, a tuned trigger, and a telescopic sight. The MSG-90 was a police marksman rifle with improved accuracy. A .22 caliber conversion kit allowed inexpensive training with the same handling characteristics. Mounting optics was simple with the Heckler and Coke claw mount system, which clamped to the receiver without permanent modification. This meant the same rifle could be fitted with day scopes, night vision devices, or reflex sights depending on the mission. By the late 1960s, the G3 was in service with over 60 nations. Many countries produced it under license, including Turkey, Greece, Norway, Portugal, Mexico, Iran, and Pakistan. In Iran, pre-revolution production meant that during the Iran-Iraq War, both sides fielded the same rifle. In Africa, the G3 earned a reputation for functioning in deserts, jungles, and mountains where other rifles struggled. Notable long service includes Portugal's African campaigns in the 1960s and 1970s and Iran's sustained use during the Iran and Iraq War. In NATO, the G3 offered long-range firepower that complemented lighter rifles like the M16. While heavier and less controllable in automatic fire, its 7.62 by 51 millimeter cartridge delivered superior penetration and accuracy at distances beyond 400 meters. How many rifles can claim to have served on both sides of a conflict, been built in more than a dozen countries, and remained combat effective after six decades? The G3 can. For those who carried it, the G3 had a distinct character. The roller delayed action produced a quick mechanical recoil impulse that was sharper than that of a gas-operated rifle but entirely predictable. The straight-line stock design kept recoil in line with the shoulder, making rapid follow-up shots easier in semi-automatic fire. The diopter iron sights were among the finest on any Cold War era battle rifle. A rotating rear drum offered four apertures for different ranges and lighting conditions. Adjustments were well protected from damage and the sight picture was crisp and clear. 
the standard trigger was designed for military reliability rather than match accuracy, but precision variants like the G3SG-1 offered a much lighter and crisper break. The rifle's nearly 10-pound loaded weight helped absorb recoil and stabilize the sights, which made accurate fire possible at extended ranges. Reliability was one of the G3's greatest strengths. Without a gas system to foul and with a fluted chamber to aid extraction, it tolerated dirt, sand, and neglect better than many contemporaries. The stamped steel receiver could endure rough handling without bending out of specification. Soldiers noted that the charging handle required effort to operate. It also locked positively to the rear when set by the user for administrative handling. Maintenance was simple. Armorers could replace barrels, bolt heads, and locking pieces quickly without extensive fitting. This ease of upkeep made the G3 especially valuable to armies with limited technical resources. Could a rifle this rugged also adapt to the demands of modern warfare in the 21st century? Century. The answer lies in its legacy. The G3's influence extends far beyond the rifle itself. Heckler and Koch scaled the roller delayed system down to create the MP5 submachine gun, which became a global standard for counterterrorism and law enforcement. In 5.56 mm form, it became the HK33, offering a lighter and more controllable package. The PSG-1 sniper rifle took the system to its accuracy limits and became one of the most precise semi-automatic rifles ever built. In Germany, the G3 served as the standard rifle until the 1990s when it was replaced by the 5.56 mm G36. Even after being phased out, it remained in use with reserve units and in specialist roles where range and penetration were more important than volume of fire. Globally, the rifle is still issued in parts of Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. Large stockpiles built during the Cold War continue to arm regular troops and reserve forces. Civilian semi-automatic versions are highly sought after by collectors and shooters for their historical significance and unique handling. The G3 is instantly recognizable. Its slab-sided receiver, paddle magazine release, and forward-folding charging handle have appeared in films, documentaries, and video games as a visual shorthand for Cold War-era firepower. For a rifle that began life as a prototype in the final months of World War II, the G3's journey has been extraordinary. It bridged the gap from Nazi Germany to democratic West Germany, armed both sides in multiple conflicts, and remains in service in many nations today. Few rifles have a story as intertwined with both engineering and history, and fewer still have written so much of that history themselves. From a late war prototype to a cold war workhorse, the HKG-3 has served across continents in conflicts for more than 60 years. Conceived in 1945, refined in Spain, and perfected in West Germany, it became the primary rifle for over 60 nations and continues to serve in many today. Its roller delayed system has proven that solid engineering and practical design can outlast political systems and military trends. As long as reliability, simplicity, and the power of the 7.62 by 51 millimeter cartridge remain valued, the G3 will still have a role. For more detailed histories of the firearms that shape the modern battlefield, subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss the next episode.